So excited. We've got a special guest joining us today, Tom Sosnoff from Tasty Trade. A couple quick housekeeping notes. Uh, just, you know, make sure you get a pen and a paper. We've got a lot of stuff to cover today. Want to make sure you don't miss anything. If you have any Facebook or phones, distractions, please put those away. Get your helmet on, as Tom likes to say, and, uh, and let's get going. So before we jump in, one quick disclosure we've got to do anytime we have an investment uh, presentation. Just a disclosure about Tastyworks. Uh, obviously, you are responsible for the investments you make. Options are not suitable, suitable for all investors. There is risk involved. And Tastyworks and Navigation Financial are separate, unaffiliated companies. So we've got that out of the way. And so we're going to jump in. And I want to start by introducing our special guest, Tom Sosnoff. And I put a brief bio up here for those who have been in the trading, investing, specifically options trading world for any amount of time. You're probably familiar with Tom, but instead of reading his bio, we've got him live with us today. So I want to just introduce him. Tom, how are you today? I'm awesome. Thanks for having me here. This is so cool. Love it. Thanks. Yeah. So what really where I wanted to start is just for those that aren't necessarily familiar with your background and how you got started, take us through starting out as a floor trader with the CBOE all the way through, you know, starting and building toss and then now what you're doing at tasty trade. Well, I'm a little older than you. That would be an understatement. <laughs> uh, I, I started this business actually in 1980 and this is the only business I've ever been in. I started uh, right out of college. I graduated in 1979 and got right into the financial service business. My first job out of school was working for Drexel Burnham, which is no longer around. We, I lasted about nine months before I met a couple of crazy guys that worked at Drexel, and they said, if you move to Chicago and just go to the floor of the you know, Chicago Board Options Exchange, we'll put up 50 grand, and, and you can trade with it, and, and we can trade, and you can be our broker. And then I didn't even know what it all meant, but I went to Chicago one day, went up, walked on the floor to see what it was like, to see if I wanted to move out here, and I packed my car the next day and started driving to Chicago. So... It was a no brainer. So I had been in Chicago for, you know, I was like 22, 23 at the time. And I've been in Chicago for the last, you know, almost, almost, you know, 36, 37 years. And I spent 20 years on the floor of the Chicago Board Options Exchange. I loved it. I was one of the survivors. Um, after trading almost the entire time in the S&P 100 pit, which was the OEX at the time, uh, I decided, you know, when, when the market started to go duly listed and everything started to get electronic, we thought about, you know, it's kind of time, we had built a nice firm, you know, 50 employees, we were prop traders. We had built a really nice business for ourselves, but we kind of felt that the business was gonna change and it was time for us to do something different. So I was partners with a guy named Scott Sheridan. We had been together for almost, you know, trading, um, uh, building a, a prop business up, which means independent traders trading your own capital. We had built a money management business up where we were managing about a half a billion dollars and we built a trading business up with about, you know, 50 or so traders on multiple exchanges here. And we decided to take everything we had and rolled into a crazy idea I had, which was called Thinkorswim. And we didn't exactly know what Thinkorswim was gonna be, but we knew it was time to do something different. And we launched this firm, you know, and, and we decided to build technology. It was our first venture into technology. It was our first venture into the customer side of the business and the retail side. And uh, we went away from the market making side into the retail side and we thought, hey, this will be fun for the rest of our lives. And we built Thinkorswim and I loved it. It was an amazing experience. We got to build the technology. We got to disrupt the whole business. We got to introduce spread trading. We got to introduce, introduce single click functionality. Um, you know, we became the number one rated brokerage firm. The only mistake, and I don't really think it's a mistake, but at some point along the way, we went public through a series of acquisitions. And once we were public and the meltdown came in 2008, 2009, uh, TD Ameritrade was able to buy us at a, you know, at a good trade for them. Um, and we didn't want to fight it. We thought it was, we, we voted against it, but I wanted to, you know, not to make a big stink and, and um, they paid a lot of money. So we sold Thinkorswim and we decided to build Tasty Trade. And the last, Almost going on seven years now, we've been building Tasty Trade and Tasty Works, and we disrupted the financial technology business in from 2000 to 2010, and now we're trying to disrupt the financial media business, which is more traditional media, Bloomberg, CNBC, 
places like that and and kind of change the way investors interact with um, content. And along the way, we decided that it was important for us to build Tastyworks because we didn't want to rely on partnerships with firms like TD or any other firm out there because we couldn't control the fee structure and we couldn't control the future of what the technology would look like. So we kind of put the band back together, built Tastyworks, which now finances Tasty Trade. And Tasty Trade is, uh, you know, amazing network, and Tasty Works is an amazing platform, and you know we're loving it. It's just, it's a lot of fun. I mean, anytime you get to spend your life doing the stuff you love, I mean, it's cool. And that's Steve. That is my life in a nutshell. It's all I've ever done. Very nice. Well, and I know you know on Tasty Trade, I've I've heard you talk about, and we'll, and we'll get more to uh, on to Tasty Works here in a minute. But I've heard you talk on Tasty Trade a couple times about you know some of the some of the trading strategies that that are kind of in one click functionality with a lot of platforms now and and you guys were really the ones that originated those even down to the the names like iron condor and strangle and that kind of thing can you talk about that a little bit well we popularized you know when we left the trading floor there was a bunch of names of stuff on the trading floor of course but when we left the trading floor you know you couldn't even route a spread order i mean i love to tell the stories because we built all this crazy functionality on TOS going back to 2000 and 2001. And we had this vision where customers could actually route an order with a single click, but nobody could fill the order because none of the exchanges could handle electronic spread. So what we do is we take the order electronically, a single click, and then we'd have to break the pieces apart and find different firms to sell it. It was a joke. And eventually we kind of, we kind of, um, used a lot of leverage and put the exchanges on the spot and said, listen, you got to build this functionality because people want to trade this stuff. And they were like, what do you mean this stuff? What is this stuff? And I'm like, they're spreads. You know, there's things like iron condors. And they're like, what's an iron condor? <laughs> you know? And we get into these things like everything from a broken wing butterfly to a diagonal to a strangle swap or something. And it was just kind of funny how it, how it all evolved. And then, you know, funny thing is six months later, you know, virtually all the exchanges offered that's what disruptors do. You come in, you bring in a concept, you find people that, you know, that, that believe in what you're talking about and how to approach. I wanted to make the markets accessible to everybody. And so in order to do that, we had to deliver the front end technology to the customer, prove to the exchanges people would use it, and then come up with creative names and, and kind of sell the concept. We learned very early on, if you can, just because something was more complex, didn't necessarily mean it was riskier. So what we tried to do was extend duration of positions, reduce the delta of different positions so that people would have less risk. And we felt that they would learn more and be strategic and it worked. And it helped people to really embrace finance and to become engaged with derivative strategies. So talk a little bit about your just kind of overall trading methodology today, uh, you know, similar to what we teach at navigation trading, you know, being a net seller of options, uh, and the probabilities. Talk about your kind of overall trading methodology and how it's kind of evolved over the last, let's say, five years. Well, it's changed a lot, um, you know, in the last two decades. And I've been, this is my fourth decade. And we are completely different traders today than we were in, for example, in 1987 or 1985 or, two, or 1995 or even 2005. Um, because we have, you know, we built a think tank and we research everything, all you know, database engineers, scientists, and our focus now is on uh, really understanding like optimal mechanics. And so our trading has changed a, a lot. We've gotten smaller in, in terms of trade size. We've gotten, we put a lot more positions on today. We use a lot more underlines. We manage our trades much earlier than we ever did before. And we are very focused on some volatility based context, not content, but context, which allows us to make quick decisions on whether something is, you know, suitable for trading. And then, of course, you know, as you know, just like you do, we are very focused on liquidity and we are very focused kind of on what we call market awareness and product indifference indifference. We don't really care what product we're trading as long as there's liquidity, as long as there's high enough implied volatility rank. And and as long as as we kind of understand and understand the strategy and it fits in with the rest of our portfolio and positions. So that's a dramatic change 
from 20 years ago of thinking, oh, the market's going to go down. I'll just buy, you know, 100 puts or 1,000 puts or, you know, or 10 puts or whatever it is or put spreads or do something like that. We, we don't do any of that stuff anymore. Completely different, you know, approach to portfolio management. Yeah, and I think, you know, just the navigation trading methodology and, and what we teach our members every day, you know, I think two of the two of the things that have really come out of some of your studies is one, closing our winners at a percentage of max profit. I mean, that's just added a tremendous amount of consistency to our to our profitability. And and the other is, you know, and this is something that I think you guys just really kind of came out with as far as data and statistics, and that is rolling your positions to the next expiration cycle early, you know, when there's two to three weeks to expiration, uh, you know, so those two things, uh, and, you know, we've always been a, a fan of selling, selling premium when implied volatility is high. Sure. But I think those two things have been real game changers for our, for our profitability. Absolutely. Hey, Steve, we did a piece two days ago that was, I don't know if you saw it, but it was exactly on that topic of rolling and managing and it showed how much you reduce your overall portfolio risk and what we call your, your standard deviation of risk. And when I looked at it, I'm like, I can't believe nobody else has ever, you know, researched this or studied this this way. But the amount, the reduction in overall, you know, just just overall risk to to trading in general. Um, it was so dramatic when you roll early and you manage early and you have the combination of both. You essentially eliminate all the back end of the duration risk and you eliminate um, and and you you take out all that kind of gamma exposure towards the end of your trades and you end up with this very manageable kind of risk profile and it was amazing and and so it's spot on with exactly what you were just saying it really is incredible when you look at kind of you know optimal approach to trading and it's so cool that you're you know that you're including that and embedding it in your teaching because um, it really does make a difference with people. Yeah. So s switching gears a little bit, um, you know, still st staying on the topic of of the way that people trade. You know, traditionally, the financial industry has led us to believe that the best way to trade is to find an expert who knows something more than us, whether it be a an economist, a financial analyst at a big bank. Uh, some type of newsletter guru that that made some prediction ten years ago, and he's still he's still living on that. I wrote a I wrote an article a few months back and, and did some training, and, and the title of it was "Your Opinion Does Not Matter." And you know I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think we're on the same kind of page about that. Can you talk a little bit about that whole concept? Sure, and and I am on the same page as you. In fact, I. I've probably written about that, you know, a, a ridiculous amount of times like you have. Um, I don't believe anybody knows anything about market direction. And if anybody did, I'd have to be up there with, you know, I mean, nobody's watched every tick in the S&Ps for 37 years like I have. I mean, I'm a junkie. So I don't think it's possible you could have watched more tape than me over the last, you know, couple decades. And I don't have any idea what's going to happen anytime. And I think I do. I want to believe I do, but I know that I don't, and I know nobody else does. I know there's no amount of money that you can throw at any kind of technology, whether it be artificial intelligence, machine learning, you know, whatever else it is, to figure out kind of what's going to happen next. And I've also watched, you know, throughout the years, I've had an opportunity to to be partners with or to sit down with um, multiple firms that that uh, multiple people and firms that have that have built great um, businesses, trading businesses and market making businesses and, and counterparty businesses. And I've watched them and all the success and all the wealth that I've watched uh, be created over, you know, multiple decades is all about mechanics and nobody gets that. So when I see somebody come on, you know, some network and I see them talk about, I think the market's going to go to, you know, 2850 this year. I think the market's going to go down, you know, 20, 17% or up. 16% or whatever else it is. It, it's all bull. It doesn't mean a single thing to me because nobody knows. Right. But what, what we have learned is that there are optimal sets of mechanics out there that if you stick with them, you can, at least, you don't, you also don't know what's going to happen next, but you put yourself in a position to take advantage of opportunity. And what are we? We're opportunists. 
and, and really good traders and really successful people in the world of finance, because the playing field is level, you take advantage of opportunity. And not everybody sees opportunity. There's a lot of people that follow the herd, and there's not that many people that, that really understand what it's like to seize an opportunity. Right. Yeah, I think in my membership is probably sick of me saying this because I say it all the time, but you know, our, our trading methodology is based on statistics and probabilities, not hype or emotion or, you know, trying to follow the latest trend or following some, some stock guru. So, so thank you. Thank awesome. you for your thoughts on that. I, yeah, I, I mean, I'm on the same page. I'm on the exact same page as you. I, I mean, you and I think alike. So before we before we jump into the Tasty Works overview, I've got one more question that I really didn't want to ask, but my membership keeps pounding and, and wants to hear more and more about this. And I'm sure you know where I'm going. Bitcoin. Sure. So I so two thoughts, two part question. One, what are your thoughts on Bitcoin as a an actual monetary currency <laughs> buying and selling? And then two, as a trading vehicle. Okay, it's really funny because I just finished about an hour long interview with Barron's a few minutes ago on this exact same topic, which will be coming out this weekend. Um, I have been I have been minimally involved with Bitcoin for the last four or five years. So I started buying Bitcoin as kind of a joke and almost as a as a gimmick just to feel like what was going on. In fact, I was the first person to interview the the founder of uh, Ethereum. And, you know, we started doing our first Bitcoin roundtable almost, you know, four and a half years ago. I don't know if you were able to see it, but it was it was crazy because I had no idea what Bitcoin was. I, I bought my first Bitcoin at uh, right around uh, 700 and then I bought it all the way down to about 200. So so, you know, just fooling around and then I lost my Bitcoin wallet and couldn't find it to sell it. Eventually paid some hacker to come in find our Bitcoin wallet, give them 10% of all we had and, and, and then ultimately, you know, sell out my Bitcoin. And now I've been trading it in the futures market, um, but very small. So I have had a lot of experience in Bitcoin as far as a, as far as a, an actual currency and, and applicable use. I don't think we're anywhere close, especially at the current levels, because there's way too much nervousness about, you know, accepting Bitcoin. Um, does it have, you know, is there is there going to be a major um, is blockchain here to stay? And the answer is absolutely. There's going to be a lot of things that change over the next decade. And there will be a lot of blockchain and ledger technology that drives everything. Is Bitcoin here to stay? Probably. But will Bitcoin be used as something other than a speculative asset? That remains to be seen for a number of years. Right now, I think Bitcoin is an is a non-hedgeable or unhedgeable speculative asset that has no real economic purpose other than it's a trading vehicle. Now, is that good or bad? I think it's great because I think it engages people in the world of finance and I think it I think it has had a very, you know, positive and profound effect on our business and getting people interested in finance if the 12 million, you know, Coinbase accounts are real and things like that. I think it's really cool. And, and I think that that's great, but I think it's nothing more at this point. It's nothing more than a speculative bubble like asset that is just it's good for fun. But you can see by the amount of Bitcoin trading on the SIBO and the amount of Bitcoin trading on the CME right now, uh, there's nothing there like it's there's no validation of the product yet. So ledger technology absolutely will play a big role going into the future and and just how we interact with the counterparty and how we cut out many, many middlemen from, you know, from here on out. Bitcoin and other digital currencies, they're here to stay, but I don't know if they're going to be much more than a speculative, again, bubble-like asset for quite some time. And looking into your crystal ball, is this, is this a fair price that Bitcoin is trading at right now? 16500 It was down like almost 1700 today. I would say that... I would bet if I had to pick a direction and pick a bet, I think Bitcoin trades closer to a thousand than it does to thirty thousand. So if you were looking at right here at sixteen thousand five hundred and says it's going to be fifteen thousand dollars lower, fifteen thousand dollars higher, I think it trades fifteen thousand dollars lower first. So I think Bitcoin has a really good chance of going back under five thousand 
And if you look at Bitcoin right now, the implied volatility, I'm, I'm just guessing because we figured this out internally. It doesn't really have a, you know, it's hard to figure out. It's not hard, but it's just we don't we don't do it very often. I think the implied volatility of Bitcoin is about 130 percent, which means that you're you're looking at it could easily the expected range in there is, you know, zero to thirty five thousand. Let's call it for the next based on current implied volatility, the range is zero to thirty thirty five thousand for 2018. So I think you can easily see Bitcoin back under 5,000, maybe under 1,000. And again, you can see 30,000 too, but, but if I was betting, pot odds to the downside. Couldn't agree more. Well, cool. Well, let's, uh, let's jump into Tastyworks. And so if you want to take over the screen, hit your screen sharing button there. And while you're doing that, first, first question is, and, and first, first kind of thing that I think a lot of people are drawn to Tastyworks for before they even see the awesome functionality is the commission structure. I mean, how do you, how did you guys, why did you guys d decide to come out with the commission structure that you do okay, and, cool. uh, and talk about that a little bit? Let me tell you about this because this is really interesting. So when we were building Tastyworks and building the logic behind it, and one of the reasons I wanted to build Tastyworks, and I hope that everybody appreciates this, and I hope the industry did, because I think we've saved individual investors, you know, up to three or four hundred million dollars this year by coming out with our rate schedule and forcing all these other firms to lower theirs. We ran hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Monte Carlo simulations with respect to commissions. When we were had a marketing arrangement with TD and other places like that, we had we could not impact their rate schedule. So when we launched Tastyworks, we we looked at how our customers were doing trading. We looked at how we were doing. We looked at the whole industry and we decided if you're going to trade small and trade often, the only thing that was different between you as a customer and firm A as a counterparty was the fee structure. So we said if we can get the fee structure down by 75% over what the average customer paid, when we were when we owned Thinkorswim, the average ticket, meaning the average trade was right around $10, the average trade. At Tastyworks, the average trade is around, let's call it $2.20. So what we found was that we were able to knock off about 80% of the transaction revenue by coming in with a very aggressive pricing model, which meant that you, Steve, if you're trading and if I'm trading and everybody that's listening is trading on Tastyworks, you're trading at essentially the same fee structure as the counterparty, which is the firm making the markets. There's no disadvantage to the street in this case. We felt that way it would truly was a level playing field. So we came out, we, we ran all these studies, like I said, hundreds of thousands, probably into the millions of studies. We did all these Monte Carlo simulations and we found that with all things being equal, the give up to theoretical and being able to do what you wanted to do with these low commission rates, made it a very fair made it a very fair game and if we could offer all the functionality like other people can have these rates but nobody has the functionality that we have you know or the speed of the platform or kind of the the sophistication and complexity of the platform so that was the that was kind of the genesis behind the whole thing and so t talk about how that's changed your trading for example you know with with a with uncovered options like a uh, strangle or straddle or something like that you know we always we always roll the untested side and we can roll from one expiration cycle to the next. Right. Typically with our defined risk trades, whether it's a vertical spread or iron condor, because sure. of those transaction costs, we've typically just kind of put it on and either either kind of win or lose. And you're typically not rolling it to the next expiration cycle because of the transaction costs involved. Has that changed the way that you trade defined risk? I, I, it's changed the way I trade everything. So let me tell you what my and, and I'm, I hope we're I hope we're I hope we're really hitting this on the head with everybody that's listening so they understand this. But when we built Toss years ago, um, this was 1999 2000. We threw everything at the wall because we didn't know what individual customers how they thought and how they traded, and we had never traded as a customer either. So we threw everything at the platform. You name it, I built everything, but I didn't. I didn't know what would actually stick at the time. So I figured the best strategy was give them everything and make it really cool. When we built Tastyworks, 
Now remember, I have the same CTO, Woody Ma, who built Thinkorswim, is building Tastyworks, and it's the same dev team. And what I said, because I, I brought put the whole team back together, and what I said to these guys was, listen, this time I want a platform that's really fast. So we built it. The middleware of this platform that you're looking at right now is all high frequency technology. We partnered with a high frequency firm in Chicago, and we said that we wanted to build, we wanted middleware that delivered your orders to the street in 20 milliseconds when the average firm is up around 700. And that's all the major firms are six, seven, eight, 900 milliseconds. We're 20 milliseconds, wrapped around 20 milliseconds. And we want to say, listen, we want to be 50 times faster or 40 times faster, and we want to be stable, and we don't want any of the bloat in the platform. We don't need all these things that we don't use anymore. We need just the ability to roll trades, manage trades, and adjust trades. And that was my challenge to Woody and his team. And that's what they delivered to us was a very simple, fast, stable platform. We have not been down for one minute in all of 2017. And this was the first year of the platform. It's the most stable platform in the business. And it is the quickest platform. Now, all the functionality is not in place. Like I told you before, we're launching a analysis page in the, within the next 10 days. You know, there's a bunch of, there's a crazy ton of other features that will come out in 2018, but it took us, you know, five, six years to build a lot of cool stuff into TOS. It's taken us, you know, a little less than that to build it into Tastyworks, but it's still a complex piece of software. But the coolest thing about this technology, and let me show you, I just have Best Buy open here, which is really nothing. I'm just, I just was looking at it for earnings this afternoon. Um, one of the coolest things about this platform, and, and again, the stock that we're looking at right here is Best Buy. And the current closing price today is 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 a twenty right where this line is. It's twenty four fifty seven. Hey, and Tom, the, I think I think you got an extra B in there. You're looking at Bed Bath and Beyond. Oh, I'm sorry, I meant Bed Bath and Beyond. Bed Bath and Beyond. I'm sorry, not gotcha. Bed, Bed Bath and Beyond. Sorry about that. I always mess up those two. So but Bed Bath and Beyond had earnings this afternoon. That's what I was talking about. And the stock closed at twenty four fifty seven. And the neat thing about this platform, Steve, was that we wanted something where let's say you wanted to do a credit spread. For earnings this afternoon, click on the bid, 27 and a half calls, just some out of the money call outside of the expected, you know, earnings range and buy the 30 calls. Now that's basic for virtually any platform. But the neat thing about this platform is if I wanted to widen the two and a half dollar wide spread to five dollars, just pull that strike down. If I wanted to sell instead of the 27 and a half calls because I wanted to collect more premium, just drag that, drag the 27 and a half strike to 25 and I can move the 32 and a half strike to 30. So there's no clicking of any numbers. My challenge to Woody was make this all drag and drop, make it super simple so anybody can do this, even if you don't know what a vertical spread it is or whatever else. And if you wanted to create an iron condor out of this, just click on the bid of the 22 and a half puts and buy, you know, the um, 20 call, the tw I'm sorry, the 20 puts. And then you have an iron condor. In this case, it's a skewed iron condor because you have a $5 wide um, call spread and a two and a half dollar wide put spread. If you wanted to make it a classic iron condor, just drag this down and both sides are two and a half wide. And this is just neat. If you wanted a five dollar wide put spread because you wanted kind of a wider put spread just to get a bigger credit, just drag that side out there. If you wanted to make it a wider iron condor like five dollars, just drag that side there. You don't have to, there's no clicking, no changing or anything. The credits pop into the bottom of the page. You can see if you wanted to change this spread and make it into an iron fly, which you guys like to do, then there you go. There's your there's your five dollar wide iron fly. And that is so simple for anybody that wants to trade spreads. And remember, we lowered the rates by 80 percent. So you only pay to put the trade on and everything you close because you manage if you manage early and you manage often and you adjust the position. Every closing trade costs you nothing. That's awesome. And, and there's no nothing else like that. No other complex platform that has any of this kind of functionality into it. Now, again, you can do this intra-month. You can do this whatever else. And then all your Greeks kind of pop into the bottom of this page right here, just so you can see kind of, you know, about, you know, all about this trade. And, and it doesn't matter to us kind of what the underlying is. But up here at Bed Bath & Beyond, the first thing we show, unlike other, other platforms, is the IV rank, which is implied volatility measured against itself. And the reason we show implied volatility measures against itself before we even show the price is just because of a quick scan, you can figure out, hey, do I want to trade this or not? You know, so so that's the neat thing about this 
about this particular trade interface. And if you want to see it, for example, in a curve mode, we'll show you this too. And you can, again, if you wanted to drag this out and make it into an iron condor, you just drag any one of these tiles. And then, like I said, in the next couple of days, there will be a analysis tab that is overlaid on top of this curve mode. So you will be able to see and adjust all the positions and look at them, you know, from if different things happen, like if implied volatility goes higher, if price moves, and you can look at all the Greeks and all the analytics and you can create simulated positions and, you know, everything in the like. So this is what we call the curve mode and this is the table mode. Excellent. Yeah, I think, that, I mean, that analysis tab is going to be huge. I think so many people, especially when they're first learning, are visual learners. Sure. And, you know, the, the TOS analysis tab is what we've taught a lot of our courses and videos on. And so that, from what I understand in, in talking to folks at Tastyworks and some of the functionality, it's going to be better and badder than than the uh, than the TOS one, too. So can't wait for that. Well, remember, so... So myself and Tom Preston and Woody, we built that analysis page on TOS in 1999, 2000. Mm -hmm. So a lot has changed. And, and, you know, the technology that's available to us has changed too. It's not just, you know, I mean, some of the technology we built on TOS is amazing. Um, but it was also the first time there was a Java platform and the first time that anybody had tried anything like that. And, and we built it in 1999 and, and we finished it up in 2000. This is 17 years later. So the technology today is much faster. You can do more stuff with it. And we'll, we'll have a lot more, you know, as soon as we launch the analysis page, we'll be able to add things to it that we never, you know, we can't, we couldn't possibly add to TOS because, you know, the, the back end wasn't there. We just didn't have the data and we didn't have the capabilities. It was too, you know, it was too deeply integrated or, or in integrated with the, with the platform. The stuff we're doing today is going to be, you know, you're going to see it. There's, You'll be able to add artificial intelligence. You'll be able to add machine learning to it. You'll be able to add different forms of of um, uh, month to month and all these theoretical outcomes and all these correlations. And so it'll be really neat because you'll see you'll see your risk in a whole different way when it's all you know. It'll take months and months, but you'll see it. It'll be pretty. It'll be pretty incredible in a pretty short period of time. And is that is that going to be available on the mobile version or just the desktop? It'll be available only on the desktop at first. Um, the guys are saying that it's doable on the mobile version, but the problem is that that haven't figured out how to um, how to do the simulations on there because it it just there's not a lot of room to um, there's not a lot of room to it, there's not a lot of room to create enough um, uh, the ability to drag and drop like we have in elsewhere on the platform. It will be available on our iPad app. Gotcha. So as soon as the iPad app's launched, you will have an analysis page on the iPad app. Cool. Yeah, keep going. Okay. So, well, this is just the first introduction to kind of the, the neat part about the Tastyworks platform. And I can change, let me change some underlying here. Like, let's go to Tesla for a sec, for example, because it, it was pretty active today. So Tesla ends up closing down, whatever, $2 today. And the neat thing about this platform is if you, um, when you first log on to it, um, it has, as a default, I have all the futures I look at, you know, at the top of this platform. And here's the Bitcoin future, by the way. And, and then, you know, just a lot of different underlines that, that I look at. But if I was to type in an underlying, like, let's just say I want to look at Caterpillar, I just click on the offer or the bit of Caterpillar. It pops in Caterpillar at the top of the page with the IV rank. It pops in a little small daily chart of Caterpillar here. It pops in your Caterpillar positions over here. It pops in Caterpillar into the chart tab over here. It pops in Ch Caterpillar into the trade page. So the design of this platform is you never have to click on anything. You just click, I mean, you only have to click on something once and it populates all the other pages. If I click on Tesla, for example, bid or offer, it doesn't matter. It populates everything from the trade page um, all the way down, you know, um, to just quotes, to positions, trade activity, trade, everything. And then obviously Tesla positions over here, if you you know wanna see them, like I have a bunch of Tesla positions on in this account. And I just scroll this up so I can um, see all my you know working orders. These are just all filled orders from today, things like that. And they all pop in in the side of the page, the, the right-hand columns can uh, configurable and detachable. So you, know, you can get out of the way if you want or, or however you wanna use it. But the platform's designed so that everything sits in front of you all the time and you never have to change pages. 
You don't have to go from page to page to page. That was one of the things that we learned from you know building Toss years ago. We wanted we wanted the the we wanted the user to stay on the main page all the time, so you didn't have to move anything. We also offer three different modes: a table mode, which is traditional, a curve mode, and um, an active trader mode, which I don't think we'll have time to get in today, but we'll do the next time we look at it. And most of us use the table mode primarily. Um, and in the table mode, like for example, if I open up something, if I have a dot here, it means I have a position in January. Um, and what happens here is it's pretty simple. The first two columns are configurable. The middle two columns are bid and ask, so obviously they're not. This line is where the current stock is. And if you um, had more strikes open, you can see that we also show you, you know, the one and two standard deviation moves. So I can show you the first line is the one standard deviation move and the second line is the two standard deviation move. And that gives you an idea of kind of, you know, where the risk is and, you know, if you're curious about that stuff. And then opening trade, oops, let me open a few more strikes. And opening trades in here is really, really simple. So we have multiple ways to do it. First, you can click on anything that you want to trade, like I showed you before. So in Tesla, if you wanted to do a credit spread, you can go, um, let me open a few more strikes actually so you can see more stuff, 16 strikes. So if you wanted to do a credit spread and you want to sell the 35 Delta, um, the, the 35 Delta option, you can sell the 42 and a half calls and buy the 45 calls, like a two and a half dollar wide spread, for example, if you wanted to. And if you want to see where the price that is, um, oops, oops, sorry, 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 I have shares in here. So I'm gonna sell the, what I say, the, 42 and a half calls by the 45 calls. And you can see that spread is 78 cents, which is right around one third the width of the strikes. And you're always going to get that if you go to about the 35 Delta option. Um, if you want to turn this into an iron condor, you can go to the 35 Delta put and do that. That's how simple that is. If you want to delete these, you can just right click and hit delete leg or hit delete leg, or you can hit the clear button and start over again. If you wanted to do a classic iron condor, you can just go up to the top of the page and hit go and it pops in for you. So you can do that as well. You can move the strikes down so you can widen it out on either way. And that's what I just showed you before. Or you can widen the strikes on one side or widen the strikes on both sides to whatever quantity. We don't care what quantity you use and we don't care what level strikes you use. And when you set up an iron condor, you can choose to go to the curve mode as well. So you can see it in a visual inside of the distribution curve and you can drag these tiles anywhere you want. You can look at all the different you know, underlying prices too. You can drag tiles. And then the green area is the win area. The red area is the loss area. Go back to the table mode and all your Greeks pop down into this line right here. So you can kind of see what's going on with this particular trade. And again, um, if you wanted to route this trade, you just hit review and send once. And if you want to review it, fine. If you didn't want to, you just double click on it. The trade pops into this column here. So it's really fast. And if you want it, if you want to adjust the trade, you just right click and hit replace order. And that just lets you go from, let's say, 93 cent credit to 92 cent credit. And if you want it to go in here and you want it to cancel order, just click on it, gone. It is lightning fast. Um, and I'll clear the trade and kind of start over. Another nice thing is in this menu up here, you can choose vertical strangle straddles, whatever you want. So if you just want to sell a strangle in here, it will go to the nearest out of the money strikes. You'll sell the strangle, you'll adjust, you're done. That's it. Pick whatever delta you want and boom, off goes the trade. Your default quantity could be whatever you want. And we've made it as simple as possible. The other neat thing about this platform, let me just close these up for a second, is if I have a position on in uh, in like Tesla, which I currently do, and let's say, uh, let me pick an option here. So let's say I have the 310 calls, which I'm currently short in here. So let's say I want to roll these calls from January to February. The neat thing about this platform, we made rolling as simple as possible. You just right click, quick roll, and you're done. Drops right in there to the Jan Feb, the Jan Feb um, calendar roll. And that's all you have to do to move something. And this would be a 710 credit from one month to the next month. If you wanted to change the February, February strike, you can move it to the 15s and now you have a 378 credit. Hit review and send and send and that's all you have to do. And it's so simple. If you wanted to, let me clear this. And let's say you wanted to roll, I'm short the 295 calls and the 310 calls in Tesla. If I click on both lines and highlight, I just click on both lines, which highlights it, and then choose to roll, I can roll both of those, the 10 lot and the 15 lot. There's no other platform that does unrecognized spreads in any quantity. 
and lets you just roll those, puts the combined credit there. You hit review and send and send, and there's your order first thing for tomorrow morning, all set up. We made it so simple that you can roll multiple strikes, multiple quantities, complex spreads, adjust roll. We've taken all of the guesswork, all the complexity out of every option table mode, every vertical sequence that you have to look at to make this the simplest platform in the world and the least expensive and the fastest. And that's what's so exciting about kind of what we're doing. So if I want to cancel this, I just click on it, cancel order, gone. So cool. So cool. So yeah. I know I know yeah. options on futures yeah. are coming soon. And is 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 that role functionality going to be available on options on futures or is that an issue with at the exchange level? Well, the difference is when you trade options on futures, just to be clear about how, how options on futures work. And, and let me pull up something just to show you. Um, so we will have options on futures here in, in a very short period of time. But when you see the options on futures, and I don't have all the, let me go to January 19th, which is 30 days. When you look at options on futures, the only difference is that you're in January, you're, because remember, what is a future? It is, it is the, the price of a future is the cost to carry and the dividends built in. And that, that's how you determine price. There's nothing else to it. There's no natural contango or anything like that. Just owning a, owning a future is owning a basket of stocks, an index future. So like owning the ES, which is the S&P 500, is just a basket of stocks. So the only difference between January futures and, um, um, and March, I'm sorry, between March futures and June futures or between the different options is where you are in the individual cycle. So if you're trading March futures and you want to um, roll to, to June futures, the only difference is going to be the cost to carry and the dividends, which may change the underlying price. So for futures, because of anything like cost to carry, or it could be seasonality if you're doing like crude oil or, you know, or wheat or corn or some, any one of the softs, you're going to have similar deltas at different strikes. Like for example, if you trade IBM, um, if you're in the 80, if you're in the, let's say the 160 calls in IBM, if you're trading January, you could trade the 160 calls in March or June, and it's the same strike. But if you're trading crude oil, and you're trading the 50 delta call at 57 right now, you're trading in Jan. If you're trading the, the 50 delta call in June, you're probably trading the 59 calls or the 58 calls. Right. So what's going to happen is we're going to roll by delta. So it's going to be very sophisticated and no platform has that yet. So that's being built in is you will roll by delta. That's, that's great. That's awesome. Yeah, it is. It's really cool. So I know. So you know, currently we have we had somebody build us a an indicator that kind of goes below our charts that shows the we like to use we're religious about using IV rank and then we also use IV percentile. Okay. Uh, I know I've heard. I, I think you guys are coming out with a similar type of a think script or some type of uh, indicator building language. Uh, any 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 thoughts on on timing for that kind of thing? Yes. Well, we built think script. I actually had um, ThinkScript was 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 my my design, um, but I didn't build it. I'm not a coder. But uh, ThinkScript something that that we built. So we built a version um, into Tastyworks. We haven't named it yet, but it's a scripting language into our charting platform, and we just delivered it to our to our dev team. Now we have to build a front end so the customers can interface with it. It's very similar, except it's a simple language, a little simpler than ThinkScript. And it's much faster. So it's the same kind of approach where you'll be able to, to graph whatever you want into from our database. And our database is extensive now. And so, so there's going to be a lot of stuff you can do. It's also going to include a lot of our – so we have a very clean and scrubbed research database. And we're going to include it into our new you know, scripting language in our, in our charting platform. Um, so it will be available to all of our users free of charge. It will be the next couple of months. It's just a function of priorities. So Steve, we're working on the, the next release for us will be the analysis page. After the analysis page will be options on futures. After options on futures will be portfolio margin. After portfolio margin will be um, the new paper trading platform. And after the new paper trading platform will be the API. And then the scripting language and API should come out at about the same time. Excellent. You're getting all the cool stuff. I'm telling you. it's. 
it's it's going to be um, it's an incredibly functional platform, and most users will save even over the reduced rates at most other firms. Most users will still cut their commissions in half. Yeah. So there's one other thing that I've that I think is a really cool, and it's, and it's just a little feature here, but um, you didn't you didn't touch on. Uh, take a look at that, or go back to that page that shows like that P50, and, and talk sure. about what that means. So let's just say I went out and I. This is TLT, which is um, a bond, you know, the the, the bond ETF, and, and uh, bonds were getting killed the last couple of days. So let's just say that I, into this down move, I wanted to sell, just as an example, I wanted to sell the 121 um, puts because they have a delta of 27. So that means they have probably about a 75% probability of profit, making at least one penny on this trade, just based on the delta. So I click on the bid, collect the 87 cents. So what we wanted to do is, you know, we're like you. We want we we encourage people to trade small, trade often, and manage your winners. And what we wanted to know is what is the probability? And we do this running thousands instantaneously, thousands of Monte Carlo simulations on this one specific trade, on this one specific underlying, looking at a ton of history for TLT. And based on TLT ranges, based on where TLT's been, the statistical chance of making 50% on this trade. So, so let's just say we collected 90 cents. We'll make this simple. It's the mid price, right? 87, 90 cents. Let's just say we collected 90 cents. What is the statistical chance of making 45 cents? Because remember how you talked about the optimal managing at 50% of winners? So that's what P50 is. It's managing at 50%. So when I said there's a 75% chance based on the delta of this option expiring worthless, there's an 86% chance that you make 45 cents. And that's neat. Yeah, it is. It's such a cool feature that there no other platform has that. Nope. Uh, you know, it's just such a cool so here's your feature. Delta on, a, on a five lot here, your delta on this trade is 134. So your delta obviously divide by five to find your delta of one, but your quantity can be whatever you want. And here's your prop. That's your probability of profit. I said 75. It's actually 77. And here's your P50 chance of making your 45 cents, which is 86 percent. And it works for everything that we do. Right. It's just we, we built a lot of really cool stuff. We haven't even included. We haven't even scratched the surface because, remember, the platform is a year old. We only launched it on January 3rd. It's not even a year old. And what we wanted to do a year ago was we wanted to introduce to the you know, self-directed investors, we, we wanted a platform that was super fast and super stable. And that was our primary goal for 2017. 2018, add functionality. Awesome. Yeah, and I mean, guys, this is this platform is is built for active traders, right? It's not built for somebody who's going to put their money in mutual funds. They don't even offer managed accounts. I mean, this is designed for the way that we trade at Navigation Trading, and it, it's such a powerful tool. Tom, talk about uh, one, one question that I've gotten from several members is obviously Tastyworks is a newer platform. Like you said, it's only been around a year. Talk about the financial strength. If, if people have questions about is it is it risky that I'm using this, put my money with this platform that's that's only a year old. Talk about that. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I don't think it's risky, obviously. Uh, we have. Um, I mean, we have just under just under a billion dollars in assets and we but we don't hold the money. Remember, when you're at an online brokerage firm, um, the money's held at a clearing firm. And so and everything has, you know, besides besides CIPIC, there, there's there's also additional, you know, there's additional insurances. So additional insurance policies on accounts. So I think they're you know, it's a million dollars cash and it's uh I want to say 30 million, but I'm not 100% sure. It's either 25 or 30 million in equity, uh, and that's for you know just money that's not invested. But as far as the firm goes, I mean we're we're very well capitalized. Let's put it that way, and everything's out there at public. But again, we don't even hold any of the money. So the clearing firm we use is a firm called Apex, which is the same firm that um, they have about three million accounts, of which we're just a tiny percentage. Um, and they do about a million something trades a day. So I think they're one of the, 
you know, biggest firms out there and probably one of the most secure firms. Um, I'm pretty happy with them. In fact, I'm very close to the, the people that own it and uh, they're one of the best, they've run one of the best prop firms in Chicago for, I don't know, the last 20 years or so, peak six. So I think, you know, you have to realize if you're, if you have your money with, um, uh, with Apex, you're, whether if you're at Robinhood, if you're at Betterment, if you're at Wealthfront, um, essentially you, you basically name the firm. All these firms are at the same, you know, this, the same, the same clearing firm. There's not that many clearing firms out there. The reason we don't self clear is it's just not a business we're interested in doing. So we feel pretty confident, um, you know, about the firm that's holding our capital, holding our customer capital. Uh, I feel better about it than I do at having my capital at big firms. I'm, I'm more nervous about having personal money at JP Morgan than I am having it at Apex. Let's put it that way. There's yeah, I whole, think a whole different level of understanding. I, I think that's the perception. You know, they think, okay, TD Ameritrade, for example, is this big firm. My money must be more safe there, but not really understanding yeah. how the clearing works. And, and when I first got asked this question about Tastyworks, I really didn't know how to answer it. And so I was talking to your partner, Christy Ross, and you know, one, one of the other things that she said about Apex is 90% of their assets is held in reserves. You know, oh, so, sure. so but that's, you know, that's barely so, so the difference between like a firm like Apex and a firm like, you know, TD, it's not just TD, but it's any one of the big firms is the big firms ladder out all the capital. And if you remember in 2008, 2009, big firms, you know, got in a lot of trouble because they couldn't even, their money funds didn't even get back to par to a dollar. So, you know, they had lots of lawsuits, things like that. We never had any of those issues going back into the, in the meltdown of 2008 because we hold everything in cash. So we don't ladder out any of the customer investments. So people, and, and I don't, I understand why people don't, you know, don't really get this because it's not something that's discussed, but all the big firms, you know, and, and whether it be Wells Fargo, whether it be, you know, Merrill Lynch, whether it's, you know, Citigroup, TD, Fidelity, Schwab, whoever else it is, they all ladder out their cash. And I find, you know, laddering out cash is far more risky than holding cash in overnight repos and overnight paper because overnight paper has no durational risk, but laddered out paper, if bonds start to drop is very risky. And so I have, you know, I love the way we do it. I think it's much safer. And, and, and I think that firms that, that hold their money in short-term paper, you know, I mean, their business is banking, our business is trading. Mm -hmm. And so I find the trading business is, is much safer than the, than the long-term banking business, at least from my perspective. Excellent. Very good. Well, Tom, I, I really appreciate you coming on with us today. Unless there's anything else, any other real cool functionality things that you want to share with us, I think that was a great overview and it was, it was, it was great getting to kind of know your background and, and where you came from and everything you guys have coming out for us. Really appreciate it. Uh, any, any, last, any last things to add? No, I, I just want to say that, you know, this is the first time we've been able to do something together. It was really cool. And I, I hope that the people that are on, you know, um, enjoyed it and um, I appreciate it at least. And, and I think it's important and I'm open to doing it as often as you want to. So just give me a holler, give me a, a little bit of a notice, you, you know, with Britt and thanks to Alan and everybody else that's, um, uh, that's on today and, uh, you know, appreciate it. Yeah, and, and for those who have been chatting, you're, you're getting answers from Jason and Alan, both of these guys. Alan runs the trade desk at Tastyworks. Jason's involved at the at the uh, trade desk at Tastyworks. The, this, this firm is so customer focused. If you pick up the phone and call them or shoot them an email, the response time and you know any question you have is going to get answered right away. It's it's a it's a pretty incredible customer service uh, support staff that they've got going on. That's awesome. Thanks so much, Steve, for the opportunity. Appreciate it. Okay. Thanks, Tom. Have a good one, and we'll talk to everybody later.